10 second security tip, go. I think a lot of people forget to check the security features in the software and services that they've already bought and to stay up to date on what those security services are. Oftentimes you'll find that you've bought a product that actually has and continues to grow additional security capabilities and it's just free additional protection for yourself. So definitely recommend staying on top of what you bought. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. I'm David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO Series. Joining me as always is Mike Johnson. We're available at CISOseries.com. Our sponsor for today's episode is Tenable. More about them later in the show. But big announcement to make, Mike. What's that? We are one year anniversary podcast today. Really? One year? One year. That is... That's shocking, amazing, and awesome all at the same time. It's actually a year and a few days, but, yeah, well, but well. we started June 1st of last year. Wow. And I think this is going to drop on, everyone's listening to this on June 4th. Wow. So That's hard to believe. That, that's a big That's a big deal. We made it a year. Well, it was a little over a year ago that I asked you to do a podcast yeah. with me. You probably looked at me and go, this guy does not have a clue what he's doing. <laughs> that, that might have been the thought in the back of my head, yes. <laughs> because. Is this going to be worth my time? Yeah. I, just more of, you know, what is the staying power? What is the, are people really interested in in hearing what we have to say? Well, I think it was the subject matter, which you had talked about, which was hitting a nerve. I had also yep. been talking about it. It was hitting a nerve. So if we just put it into audio form, hopefully we'd hit a nerve in audio it form. Seems to work appears out. that we did. I also want to mention that this Thursday, I will be at the West Michigan IT Summit in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with my other co-host, Alan Alford, recording a live version of this very podcast mm-hmm. on stage. Our guest will be Dan Lorman, the former CISO and CSO for the state of Michigan. It's a free event, and the details are available, as you might imagine, at CISOseries.com. Now, we are doing this recording in person, and uh, across the table from me and you is Frederick Lee, also known as Flea, who is the CSO of Gusto. Flea, thank you so much for welcoming us into your office. Thank you so much for having me. I'm actually super excited to be on this, especially if it's the one year anniversary. I remember when this first dropped and just like how how excited I was actually just to hear about it and just touches a nerve I think everybody in security has to deal with. What's a CISO to do? Chris Romeo, the CEO of Security Journey, wrote a post where he asked, what if I had to develop an application security program with a budget of zero dollars. What he presented was a means to lean on the OWASP open source community and tools to build an application security program. So Flea, I know this is a a pretty big ask, but how would you go about building an application security program with no money? I think this is actually a great thought exercise to begin with anyway. And I like the question purely from the standpoint of it frames how you should be approaching building your app sec to begin with. When you have zero budget, the first immediate thing you want to start to fall back on is how can you leverage people? And how can you leverage the existing people that you have within your organization? And honestly, that's the only way that a good, even well-funded security programs can scale. You have to start with the people. OWASP obviously is an excellent resource in particular because it already presents a lot of knowledge for your existing developers, program managers, et cetera, within the organization. And so when I think about how do I get started with just building an AppSec program from scratch with zero dollars, kind of like what I call bootstrap slash startup security. And that's generally first utilizing something like OWASP to just purely educate the developers on the particular like problems within their development domain slash framework. So for example, if they are a web developer, obviously OWASP is targeted and bent towards that, but it actually also has some other additional useful security tips for people that are doing things that are in the embedded side or on mobile, et cetera. There's also some really, really, really good tools from OWASP, all the way from things like OWASP's app, which you can actually integrate into your CI CD pipeline to help with some really, really basic, effectively black box testing. You also have things like dependency checker, which allows you to say, hey, well, what third-party jars slash third-party dependencies am I incorporating to my software? 
are those secure, et cetera. But I really, really always come back to this notion of utilizing OWASP as kind of like this knowledge resource. Because even within OWASP, you can teach developers how to do things like threat modeling. It will actually just walk you through some of these like really, really basic things that we do inside of security to build out a fairly reasonable and somewhat mature AppSec program with zero budget. And I would argue that everybody should be starting from that point, even if you have infinite money. So Mike, I'll ask you, have you actually done this exercise? And do you agree, like, even if you got all the money in the world, you should be doing this exercise regardless? So I haven't done this exercise, but I do agree that why would you go anywhere else other than OWASP? This is uh, guidance that has tried and true. It's stood the test of time. It's basically the Bible when it comes right down to it. And it's an organization that you can get involved in and contribute back. It's kind of like the win-win all around where you can learn from it. You can teach your developers. You can teach members of the management team. You can, I mean, you can teach non-technical folks the things that they need to look at and care about when it comes to web application security from OWASP. And then also, as, as Flea is talking about, use that to also teach non-web app developers for your back-end services. They have to deal with input as well, and so they have to figure out how to sanitize that input. And OWASP provides both great guidance and great tools for dealing with that. So I 100% agree with what Flea is saying. Even if you have infinite money, even if you're going to scale and hire 100 AppSec engineers on your team, you're still going to be working with OWASP. So start there no matter what. When you say start there no matter what, what is the way one actually starts with OWASP, I guess? Obviously, the basics is purely teaching your developers, quote unquote, the OWASP top 10. And that's like, you know, a really small, digestible set of vulnerabilities that you can have developers learn about. And these are... In general, the more commonly occurring vulnerabilities um, and, and the more commonly occurring like development techniques that developers wrestle with. And I say that's just fundamental because now you're teaching developers the language of security. You can actually have, you know, maybe more high bandwidth conversations with them regarding security. And it effectively arms them so you're literally teaching them to fish, right? That, no pun intended. Hey, you're a CISO. What's your take on this? I was chatting online with a pen tester, Benjamin McEwen from Scotland, who reaches out to CISOs trying to responsibly disclose, that is key, not expose, uh, credible security vulnerabilities. Now, it's his way to try to get recognized. And he's frustrated, though, in his ability to find permanent work because those hiring only see him as an independent researcher. I will ask you, Mike, is his exercise the right approach to get recognized and what can a young, talented security person in his position do to make himself more attractive to CISOs? It's an approach. I won't say it's right or wrong. So it, Salesforce had a massive bug bounty program. I know we hired directly from that pool. So people overseas, we relocated them. So I, I think what, what Benjamin is doing is a pretty solid approach. And he's done a lot of this, by the way. I'm, I'm making that assumption. He has. And so I think it's, I don't, I actually don't know why. He feels that because he hasn't worked in a large environment, that he's independent, that he's not attractive. Do you think that doesn't factor in that at all? That doesn't factor in at all. So it's probably him and that's even a worse situation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't, it might be just like his personal situation. Maybe he can't leave Scotland. And so therefore, what are the local companies in Scotland who would be hiring pen testers? I don't know. There might be some other issues that he has a certain thing that he wants to do and he can't find that perfect job. And, and, that's, and that's fine. But the reality is if a solid pen tester, especially someone young and passionate, I have a feeling that Benjamin's going to be receiving a lot more calls from CISOs because after, of this? after this episode. <laughs> Possibly. Drops. All right. Does someone like this, is this attractive to you, Flea? Like if someone actually responsibly disclosed a vulnerability here in Gusto, would your eyes perk up and actually want to talk to that person about hiring even? It's nuanced because I think it also depends on the finding itself. Like if it's a really, really, really obscure, difficult finding that effectively makes them stand out. And I think one of the issues that Benjamin's going to have to deal with is seven years ago, this would have made him stand out in the industry. 
coming forward to companies saying, hey, I found vulnerabilities inside your website, et cetera. Now he has to deal with just a large amount of signal that we're getting from literally thousands of other uh, security researchers. So if you are using a bug bounty platform or if you just run your own bug bounty, you're obviously getting tons of people coming in. I think from Gusto's perspective and my perspective in general, it has to be something really unique about the finding from that particular pen tester. If you want to stand out, it has to be more than just, hey, I found another cross-site scripting on your website. It has to be like, hey, I found something really, really difficult to exploit, really, really difficult for anybody else to find and to really set themselves apart from other researchers that are effectively sending us the low-hanging fruit. So how do you think about someone who's persistent? Because I, I agree with you, uh, one, one yeah. finding isn't enough. Yep. I would even have a hard time like this is a really obscure, amazing finding. Still don't know that's getting my attention to say, yep. hey, I'm going to go hire this person. But if you've got someone who's persistent, who reports bug after bug after bug and clearly is learning more and more about the application over time. By the way, if they're reporting bug after bug after bug and yeah. not actually <laughs> also getting any money for yeah. it, that's – they really want a job. Yeah. There, there's there, Again, there's a built-in assumption I'm making here that it's through a bug bounty program. And, and so therefore, there is some sort of sure. compensation yeah. that's going in, in return. But that's kind of what I'm thinking about here. And, and what's kind of your thoughts, Flea, on someone who's just persistent and kind of keeps at it? Even then, it's still somewhat nuanced. In all honesty, I think the future of the industry is going to go more and more towards people outsourcing their pen testing outside of really, really large firms, you know, obviously Salesforce, Google, et cetera, they, they definitely need that expertise in-house constantly. They're generating that much code. A lot of other shops aren't generating that much code and they're going to do well by focusing their hiring budget on bringing in builders, people that can actually really improve their software. When I think about young people such as Benjamin, et cetera, who are looking for that pathway into security, I always say build, build, build. Like showing me something that you have on GitHub, even if it's you building your own tools to help you as a security researcher, that impresses me. And that puts you at the top of my list of people I want to go after. I can go out and essentially go out and buy a pen test from NCC or MWR. There's tons and tons of good shops, you know, Doyen, you know, include security, et cetera. So there's all these other people we can lean on for good technical pen testing. There aren't as many people we can lean on to help us build good security into our products. I would love to see somebody with that passion that's reporting numerous vulns or numerous defects, you know, several times a quarter. I want to see them also show me, hey, Flea, here's how you can fix this. I wrote some code and I think you might want to take a look at this tool that I built for you. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Tenable, and I'm speaking with their VP of Product Marketing, Gavin Millard. Gavin, we talk a lot on this show about vulnerability management, and finding vulnerabilities doesn't seem to be the problem, but determining which ones to deal with first and actually remediating is an issue. How is Tenable helping? If you look last year, there's over 16,500 vulnerabilities disclosed, 59% of which were critical or high using you know, standard scoring methods. And this causes a huge problem for organizations because it's what do I focus on first? Where do I spend my precious energy going and patching? And we've analyzed all of the vulnerabilities that are out there. We track about 120,000 different vulnerabilities. And what we're doing now is we're using machine learning algorithms to predict which vulnerabilities are actually going to be exploited rather than those that could be exploited. And we're seeing about a 97% reduction in the vulnerabilities that we're asking our customers to go and patch. Excellent, Gavin. Thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank Tenable for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. It's time to play What's Worse. All right. I've got a good What's Worse scenario for both of you gentlemen. You know how this game is played, right, Flea? Yeah. All right. Two scenarios. They both stink. You're not going to like either one, but you got to pick one. And you have to pick one that is worse than the other. This comes from Kim Beeler, who's the director of user experience at Expel. And she asks, what's worse, poor to no access control policies or your entire staff is using one of the top 10 worst passwords. <laughs> wow, that's an interesting one. Uh, usually we hear things that are like, like polar opposites polar of each opposites, other. Right. So, Kim, this is an interesting one. So we're really talking about poor access controls. Poor to no access controls. Poor control to no policy. access controls 
or everyone has everyone one is, of the top ten. One of the top ten bad passwords. Those are pretty horrible. Wait, everybody has one. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd I'd really say. Because usually I try and weasel my way out of this with mitigations. A mitigation for bad passwords is you've got MFA. Right, right. right. Uh, but and, that's not an option. And so I, I'm... you got to figure out which... Again, as we know, this is just a risk yes. management game. But which one is posing a higher level of risk? So the higher risk would be the bad passwords. So that's the one that I'm saying is worse in, the, in this scenario. And the reason why is you've essentially got... You're worrying about your employees having too much access versus an outsider having too much access. I would rather have insiders with too much access than outsiders with too much access. Now, isn't the, though the insider threat the more dangerous one? The reality and the reason and the rationale behind that statement is there's an assumption that your walls are decent. And so therefore, your insiders already have privileged access, and so they're the ones who are going to abuse it because it's really hard for people to get from the outside in. But if you're leaving the front door open with bad passwords, I don't see how insider threat is the thing that I'm worried about in that scenario. All right. Good point. Flea, which one's worse? Are you agreeing or disagreeing here? I'm 100% agreeing with Mike here. I mean, I'm not even sure how much I can even add on top of that. Also, I think that it's easier to track and fix the access problem when you literally can just log and monitor everybody and look for deviations there whereas everybody just having a crappy password that literally is just opening the doors wide open it's almost to the point now especially with how you know passwords have proliferated across the internet it's almost to the point now is you basically don't have passwords at that point just because it's already known by everybody Every employee has... Yeah, yeah that's a scenario. It's, it's awful. I, mean, I, I don't see how that company would still be in business no, at that they, point. They, I mean, <laughs> Flea makes a good point about the credential stuffing yeah. out there, right? I mean, this is a company that would be owned six ways from Tuesday the minute the doors opened. I mean, with passwords that bad, they're done. That's a problem for that company. Yes. Uh, feel sorry <laughs> for that company. Close your eyes. Breathe in. It's time for a little security philosophy. On Quora, a question right out of the Matthew Broderick movie War Games asks, if a student hacked into university computers and changed his grade in cybersecurity to an A, does he actually deserve the A? Now, except for one person, everybody said no, but for completely different reasons. I'll start with you, Mike. Are you saying no? And if so, what's the reason? I definitely say no to this. And the the reason is there's an aspect of cybersecurity which has to do with morals and ethics. Because then that would make you a bad security. Exactly. Or not a bad security. That make you a well, I mean, this a, is this is a, a white criminal. hat. This is a white hat versus black hat thing. Exactly. Right? You know, the, the white hat says, Hey, I found a vulnerability, and they go and talk to the professor about it without exploiting it. The black hat says, well, I'm just going to get an A because, well, clearly their security sucks and I can do this, so I'm going to get an A. And since it's a cybersecurity course, then clearly they should know what they're doing and so on. It's it's basically an ethics question at this point. It has nothing to do with skills. But is there any part of, quote, winning the game as a sort of no, reference it's not a game. Star Trek? It's not, it's not a game. No? Okay. What you need to teach people, especially in courses – is the importance of ethics. As a cybersecurity professional, you're going to have a lot of trust placed in you. You have to take that seriously. And someone who goes and changes their grade and thinks they deserve it, they're not taking it seriously. They're not exhibiting the proper ethics. And so this is someone who not only do they not, not deserve that A, they deserve to get an F and perhaps even removed from the school. All right. Lee, I throw it to you. Do you agree? No, they should not receive an A and anything to add or change on what Mike said. I'm just going to expound on what Mike said. Immediately when I saw this question, that was the first thing I thought as well. I was like, no, they don't get an A. They get kicked out of the class because ethics is so critical to, to what we do as security professionals. But I would also say that there are a lot of times where you will have the ability to do extreme harm. Yes. Say not just trust, but you will definitely have the skill and the capability to do extreme harm. So this wouldn't be the first case that this person would be able to do no, this. And, and that's, that's a, I think that actually goes right back to Mike's point. Because we kind of have this extra access, this extra privilege, there's a higher burden upon us as security professionals to operate ethically and, and morally in these scenarios. 
one of the dirty secrets in security is that actually security teams don't have that much power. There are a, a couple organizations where security just carries around a big hammer and, a, and beats everybody upside the head. But for the most part, people do what security says because they trust us. And if we break and violate that trust by taking shortcuts, you know, abusing the power that we have, then that removes so much credibility and so much power that, that we need at other times. So it, it's super, super important. And it's important that security professionals learn that lesson early. And I know that is one of those things that we're still wrestling with as an industry, but I agree with Mike 100% here. This kid fails and gets kicked out of the class. Yeah. Now, I should point out that in war games, Matthew Broderick, not in a security class, but does change his grade and it's sort of applauded as the hero for this. I think He's that, a very different so, character. So there's a few things, right? First of all, that's a movie. Yeah. I am, I'm well aware of that. But, but second it's of all, also a little dated. Oh, <laughs> but that, that's what I was yeah. getting at. Is it's a very different yeah. time. Cybersecurity was not in yeah. an industry back then. It was not a profession. And when hacking the school computers was unbelievably easy back a absolutely. then. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, when, when I was in high school and college, it was easy. Yeah. So it's not been that long that it's been difficult. But we live in a different world. And, and Flea really said it right that a lot of what we're able to do depends on people trusting us. And the moment we breach that trust, the moment we're no longer worthy of that trust, why do they work with us anymore? So it's, it's a different time. And now, Steve Prentice with this week's cloud security tip, brought to you by OpenVPN. The idea behind an advanced persistent threat is both intriguing and a little distracting. It sounds like the title of a Tom Clancy novel, maybe a sequel to Clear and Present Danger. Designed to penetrate a network, operate while hidden for a long time, all the while receiving commands from an outside agent, an APT is more sophisticated than everyday malware and tends to be deployed against large targets. But it's still a concern, especially when the cloud comes into play. The cloud's limitless volume, used by millions of organizations in close proximity, make it a treasure trove of available data and an ideal platform to enable an attack and distribute command and control files. In addition, managed service providers who oversee and maintain cloud infrastructure for their clients can become a natural point for exploitation. Perhaps the best lesson to take from the advanced persistent threat is that they might not be something you're most susceptible to, and although they should not be ignored, it would not be wise to be distracted by them when you really should be focused on basic cyber hygiene. What do you think of this pitch? All right, Elvis Moreland of Ignite Assurance Platform pitches the following. Ignite Assurance Platform brings security GRC automation to the enterprise that is struggling with manual GRC processes, inconsistencies, and varied business compliance drivers. Ignite Insurance Platform is a leader in collaborative security and GRC solutions for global corporations. For corporate risk and compliance officers who depend heavily on the protection of their resources, Ignite is the ultimate translation engine for simplifying compliance across regulations, standards, and guidelines. The Ignite platform is used by leading corporations in diverse industries such as healthcare, defense, and technology. Ignite is headquartered in Miamisburg, Ohio, and a U.S. veteran-owned business. I will start with you, Flea. What do you think of that pitch? I probably would actually just skip over this as fell in my inbox. And I'll, I'll give you some context here. Part of it is it didn't immediately talk to me about how it's going to actually solve a problem for me. It gave a lot of context. It gave a lot of background. It, it you know, mentioned things around other processes that thinks it can actually make things better. It talked about where it's headquartered, who owns it. That's all great. However, I get tons and tons and tons of vendor emails every single day, and I need things that are actually just going to speak to me immediately and tell me how is this solving a problem for me. And I don't think it was necessarily pithy enough to do that. Digging underneath it, though, I like what it it seems to be alluding towards what it does, which is this standpoint of like, hey, maybe you have Archer inside your enterprise here, and, and this is going to be less painful than Archer. No offense to the Archer people out there. Actually, I guess maybe that was offensive. <laughs> but, <laughs> and so like, I, I get what it's actually kind of driving at, but it didn't really show how it's going to create less work for me and how it's going to make my enterprise better and also how it's going to explicitly do some risk reduction for me on, on that aspect. I wasn't super excited by that pitch. So. All right. Not super excited. Mike, would you say you agree or disagree well, with So Flea it's here? interesting because I had a very different reaction. And really what they're getting at and, and kind of 
I guess, kind of what you were talking about when you're digging under the covers. The idea of automating GRC really speaks to me. And so, well, that, again, you're two different systems. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It'll speak to one and not yeah. to the other. You know, the, the perfect pitch for everyone doesn't exist. Yeah. But exactly. for, for me, that got my attention. But I do agree with you that the second paragraph is almost contentless. I appreciate the you know the call out to veteran owned business. I mean that that's a good yeah. thing to to call out when you're in that case. But the rest of so, it has so very little that, content. That is that is valuable to you yes. to hear that. Oh, yeah, that's actually valuable to me also. Okay, it's just that when I read that first sentence, it needs to be okay. I know exactly what it is and why so I want to keep reading. What should have been taken out? What should have been added? I would have taken out the entire second paragraph except for the veteran-owned business. And, so start, and repl- start the second paragraph. We're a veteran-owned business. No, and no, then, no, no, no. Or maybe uh, close that, it. That, that's how you still close it. But the second paragraph should be more of the how. Where you've got this initial, we automate GRC, great. That's actually going to get a lot of attention. Once you have someone's attention, you want to anchor the hook. So you want to set the hook by saying, here's what we actually do. Here's the how. Here's... Yes a little bit of an explanation, do that in here, and it's going to speak more to what I look for in a pitch. I would agree adding the how would have changed that for me. Every GRC product out there says it's doing automation. Even Archer says like, oh, this is automation. We, we've got an issue with Archer, I understand. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I right. think we, we bear the scars of Archer. <laughs> okay. it really is. All right, let me read you another pitch. This is a, an initial connection request that I personally received via LinkedIn, and it went like this. As a scientist, I have sold only through technical credibility. I have invented a security control syntax language that I am in the process of contributing to the public domain via ITU SG17 security. Would you have a few minutes to chat? I'll start with you, Mike. Again, this is out of the blue initial request. I think it's interesting. And it's actually very concise to the point. I always like when people are contributing to the public domain. I'm not sure that we need yet another security control syntax language, but on the flip side, it's something that I would be at least interested to have an initial conversation because it could go somewhere and it could be something that really could have a meaningful impact. So it didn't land with me because he was sending it to me, which, and I'm not a CISO, and I honestly, I don't know what ITU SG17 security is. Lee, what do you think of that? This wouldn't land with me either just because it wasn't specific enough about what I'm going to do at these few minutes to chat. Like, what is he going to cover, et cetera? And I'm sure, like, Mike definitely identifies with this. Time is just precious, and I just want to get straight to it and just, hey, this is what I want to talk to you about. Here's how much time it's going to take, uh, et cetera. So it's a whole th- situation is if this just happens to be of interest to you, it's going to land with one yeah. But it may not land yeah. with another. Yeah, and I think I have a fair amount of free time at the moment, so my yes. perspective <laughs> might be a little bit skewed on this. Time certainly is is critical, and it might just be with some of these pitches, as I've said over and over again, sometimes it's just the right time. Yep. And for me, this would be the right time. If I were actually working and had a lot going on, maybe not. All right. Well, that brings us to the close of this show. Lee, thank you so much for being on our one year anniversary show. I saw him speak on a panel with our past guest, Justin Berman, cool. CISO of Zenefit. He was very, very expressive. I was like, oh, <laughs> he's going to be perfect on the podcast. So I approached him afterwards and said, could we do a podcast next week? And what do you know? We're in his office and, doing and just that are. right now. Yeah. You delivered, and I appreciate that, Flea. I also want to thank our sponsor, by the way, Tenable, for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Thank you, Tenable. And I want to let our listeners know that please, when you hear from our sponsors, just acknowledge that they are a sponsor of the podcast at bare minimum. We would ask you that. We're not requiring you to start forking over six-figure assignments, but just acknowledge that they're a sponsor of the podcast because we appreciate that and they would as well. All right, Mike. Any closing comments for our guest right here? Thanks for joining us, Flea. I, I really appreciated the talk about OWASP and, and starting an AppSec program. I think a lot of people, if that's all they listen to of this show, please listen to the whole thing. But that is an amazing takeaway for people who are trying to figure out where to get started with AppSec, how to get a program rolling. You really gave some great tips. So, so thanks for that. Thanks for having us in your office. This is a beautiful place. Thank you for that. And 
Thank you for a short notice. That's awesome that David was able to, I guess, twist your arm in a very short period to have you on the show. So thank you so much for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure to have you with us. No problem. It, it took no arm twisting at all. <laughs> I've been dying to be on this podcast. Well, I'm glad. It, yes, it is. It is so honor. please make a plug for Gusto. Make a plug. Are you hiring? Almost everybody we interview is hiring. I am definitely hiring. Gusto across the board is actually hiring and, and definitely want to, want to put in a plug for the great work we're doing here at Gusto. And I think because we are a people platform and people come first, what we're doing here, we think deeply and passionately about security, about privacy, and we're actively recruiting for people who have that same passion, who want to build essentially the world's best people platform. And that's not just in security, that's all of our engineering disciplines, program managers, et cetera. So, so please come and check us out at gusto.com. And also you'll get to see this fancy, nice, awesome office that I guess you should see the office. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's this giant cavernous space and it's a shipping. There's a giant hook that hangs from the center of the ceiling here. That very unique. Yeah, it's well, I, I like. Is that point. how you fire employees? By the way, <laughs> no, no, no. Like the thing I love about that crane is that to me, the crane, the shipping crane, is like the best symbol for what it means to really run a security team well, to really run an engineering organization well. Which is this idea of taking weight off of somebody else, of us lifting weight off somebody else's back, so they can actually do the true work that they want to do. And I think that, that speaks volumes about what security is really supposed to be about. Awesome. Well. Thank you, Flea. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, audience, for supporting us for an entire year. Entire year, yay. Yeah, and if yeah. all goes well, there'll be many more years. Many more years. Many more years to come. He's not scared of it. Uh, <laughs> not awesome. this time. Thank you again, everybody, for supporting us for an entire year of this podcast. We are thoroughly enjoying it, and we're going to keep doing it for you. And by the way, we love your contributions. As you can see, this is a heavily, heavily listener-contributed show, and we continue to appreciate it. So thank you for supporting the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. We eagerly seek your input for the show. Please send us vendor pitches you'd like us to critique, ask us CISO questions, and anything else. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, contact David Spark at sparkmediasolutions.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.